My guest today is Brendan Burns. Brendan, how are you, sir? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. Tell me, what do you do? Uh, so I'm the corporate vice president uh, and distinguished engineer focused on cloud native open source on Azure, as well as um, the Azure control plane and all of our client experiences, web portal, command line tools, uh, all of that kind that of That sounds pretty impressive, but that's not what you're famous for. I guess not. I, I think know. you're most famous for is one of the, uh, what's the word, co-creators of that Kubernetes, works. which works. is kind of the ubiquitous. Uh, uh, well, you tell me, what is Kubernetes and what's, why is it important? Uh, well, I mean, Kubernetes is an open source orchestrator for containerized workloads. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it has sort of become the predominant way that people build cloud native applications. Um, not just in the cloud, but on premise as well, modern applications. Okay. Um, so it's sort of a one of a class, one of a class of uh, software solutions out there. Yeah, um, I mean, it sort of became the one that everybody that's uses. That's what I was going to say. It's 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 sort of be, it's the default solution when you want to do orchestration yeah. containers, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it it became that sure. really quickly. I mean, I was you, you invented it in like 2014 or 15, and within a year or two, it, it took off yeah. it, it, faster than almost any other project I've seen. It's funny, I would I would say it felt it felt long. Really? Uh, there's a solid Yeah, I think so. I mean, well, when did we start? Um, we started in like fall of 20, 2013. Okay. Um, that was not you know, not public, but that was sort of when Craig and Joe and I kind of started the first kicking around of the idea. That's when you got the whiteboard and the marker out and started saying, let's... Yeah, I just kind of like, you know, it started out kind of as a demo of what's possible and, you know, sort of like duct tape and bubble gum and just to kind of give you the, like, the experience uh -huh. of like, what what could this be? Um, and then, you know, we were joined by a bunch of other people as we sort of got a little bit of momentum um, and, you know, started talking about it uh at uh, DockerCon, I started talking about it publicly at DockerCon in 2014. Okay. Um, and then I'd say, I mean, we hit a 1.0 a year later, but it wasn't really until, I don't know, maybe 2016, 2017, where I really felt like we weren't, you know, arguing for why this specific container orchestrator should be the one you would use. Mm -hmm. You know, I think people don't always remember, but, um, you know, Mesos uh, was a, was a pretty, popular solution that sort of predated predated Kubernetes, predated contain popularized predated the popularization of containers actually okay um you know and, and docker had a solution called swarm and and honestly actually when we first came out you know there was tens or 15s or 20s of of these solutions that were out there on github in various stages of being built by various people and companies and i think one of the things we did really well was in Kubernetes provide a place where a lot of people could come together and collaborate in a safe way, in a, in a way where no matter who you were, you could sort of see in this ecosystem a way that your company, your business could be successful. And I think that's, you know, that's sort of one of the reasons why it became the predominant solution is because we just managed to collect a really large coalition. Um, a lot of people didn't really care. They just wanted one. Sure. Right. And it's always better to have, lots of people working on the thing you're working on mm. rather than being the one who's like kind of trying to keep it moving if you're by yourself. Sure. So. Well, what motivated you to create this uh, orchestration? You, as you mentioned, there were other solutions that tried to solve that problem before you started. Why, why didn't you just like go with that? Yeah. I mean, I think, there's, I think there's, I think there's two, two answers. Like one is a lot of the ones that were mature weren't open source. Okay. Um, they were sort of, inside of companies, inside of large internet scale companies, and they weren't open source. Um, and then, you know, if you look at Mesos, um, uh, Mesos was not really, it, it had been built for big data. It had been built to support running like MapReduce and MapReduce++ and other kinds of, um, you know, big data stuff. And so it wasn't really, like they were sort of pivoting a little bit and trying to do, um, application workloads, but we really wanted something that was sort of container native from the ground up. Mm. Um, Docker containers at the time, I mean, the, the, the impetus really was that, um, you know, a lot of this orchestration technology was predicated on the idea that people would use containers, right? Um, 
but in 2013, people didn't, or 2012, people didn't use containers. It's harder. Uh, it's hard to know that now because it's it's it, it's, it's hard to remember. Ubiquitous. But the truth is, and that was but they didn't. And that was right? just what Nobody seven did. years ago, eight years ago. <laughs> and and Docker pop. I mean, the technology had been around for a while, but Docker packaged it up in a really user friendly way that addressed a bunch of pain points for individual users and really popularized the idea of building this container image and building this container. Um, and so like, that was the moment when we saw this energy in the system. Um, but Docker was really focused on like the DevX and the individual machine. How does something run on one machine? How does a developer build a container and push it to a registry and pull it places and do all that kind of stuff? But there was all of this orchestration that we knew was necessary to build reliable systems that spanned across multiple machines um, and had things like load balancing and had sort of like higher level concepts than just that one container, which is kind of what Docker was doing really well. Um, and so it was that combination of like that momentum as well as, you know, the need that we saw out in the community, um, you know, and I think also a sense of, um, you know, that we had had some experience that we kind of felt like, you know, other people had a lot of the pieces, but we kind of felt like we had the puzzle box. We kind of knew how the pieces were supposed to go together. Mm -hmm. um, and so that also motivated it because it was it was like, well, th there's going to be a solution for this. Let's go see it. If it's a solution that we can like influence and, and, and motivate. OK. Tell me a little bit about so. the process of creating it. Uh, were you, uh, did you use pieces? <laughs> well, I mean, it starts like anything else. I mean, I think it starts with like a demo, okay. right? And a POC. And like, I mean, you have to like, in order to, I mean, my experience as a, I've created a lot of things, actually. This, you know, Kubernetes may be arguably the most famous, but there's a, a lot of them. Um, and I think that one of the most important things you can do in that early stage is um, you have to get other people to believe to see, to see your vision and to believe your vision. Okay. Right. Um, and a lot of times for me anyway, and I think for a lot of people, you know, that become that, that starts with sort of a, a pretty good demo. Um, not like a, you know, video like PowerPoint, Hey, this is what it could be, but like something that somebody can actually take and like mess around with and do it themselves and, and really feel it because I think that makes it real. Like they move from the, like a lot of people I think get stuck on the, listing out in their head, like all the things that are going to be hard or all the things that are going to be, are, are not quite solved. You're not quite figured out. Um, you know, it's kind of like, if you're thinking about driving from here to, you know, from in Seattle to the East, you know, Eastern Washington, you're like, Oh my God, there's this pass and it might snow. And then what about the speed traps? And like, but like, and you so that if you, if you focus on that, like you might never get in the car. Right. Um, but if you show people the picture of like, hey, this is wine country over in Walla Walla and like you could be at this you know, winery in this nice bar and like all this stuff. And people are like, man, I want to go there. <laughs> right. And they forget about all of the like the passes and the snow and the blah, 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 six hours in a car, blah, 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 blah. blah right. So like there is this sense of like it, even if it's like just a, a, a an image of what could be, if people believe in it, they get excited about it and they want to go there. Right. And so I think that's part, that was a big part of the initial part of it was the like, let's talk about what the opportunity is and let's talk about the, the, the place where we could go. Um, and, and then I think there was also a lot of like fighting for it to be open source. I think at the time, you know, open, it, again, similarly, I think like open source was still, it was a thing, but it wasn't like, I don't think that the people who are responsible for the cloud had really grokked just how much open source was going to come to dominate the cloud. Mm. Um, and, and not just in sort of like the, Oh, it's running Linux way, but in the like, no, no, like there's going to be an ecosystem of tools that people use and they're all going to be open source. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of arguing about like, well, why couldn't it just be, a product, yeah. right? Why does it have to be this project that can run on my competitors and that can run on premise yeah. and that can run anywhere? And it was sort of like, well, because people are like, well, but wouldn't it be better if the only place where people could run orchestrated containers was our platform? Yeah. And you were working and for like, Google at the time, right? It's yeah. Like, and I was working well, for Google at the time. You were getting paid by Google to develop this. They must have had a pick yeah. about that. Well, and in fact, I had, I mean, I, I, I had a person who I worked with who, who, who said basically like, you're getting this company to fund your startup on their own dime. And yeah. I said, no, like it turns out this is the only way you get to win. Okay. Right. Like 
you know, you don't get to choose. Like I've had other people come to me up to various times and say like, I know we're going to do this platform and it's only going to work on this other cloud and, and what, you know, it, where it's their cloud usually. Sure, yeah. And you're like, well, that's nice. You know, I understand why you want that, but it doesn't work that way. Right. Like the, the, the world is a multi-cloud place. The world is a hybrid place. Yeah. The world wants one solution. And so if your solution doesn't go to all the places that the world wants to go to, the world is just going to find a different solution. Right. I think sometimes people get like very myopic about thinking about just the thing that they are building and not realizing that like it exists in a, like there's billions of projects out on GitHub, well, millions of projects out on GitHub. Right. And like your project isn't special, especially in those early days, right. your project is very much not special. And if there's some aspect that people don't like, they're just going to go put their energy somewhere else. Right. Um, and, and so I think that was a lot of the discussion as well as the, like, look, like, if you want this thing to win, it has to be open source, whether you like the fact that it's open source or not, it kind of doesn't matter. Okay. Like, like open source is a component of winning. Um, and that was definitely an argument and discussion. It sounds like that was your, uh, position was this should be an open source project at, at way back in. It, I, so I, like, I would say like, it's different. It wasn't this should, it was, this has to be. Got it. Right. Like I'm not really, I mean, I love, I love open source and I love open source communities. Um, but I'm not like a zealot, okay. right? Like plenty of my teams write closed, co closed source code, mm -hmm. right? I'm not like every piece of code must be open source and that's the only way to write software. But it was just sort of like, look, if you want this thing to be where it is, you know, where Kubernetes is today, where it's the dominant orchestrator that everybody uses, mm -hmm. like if that's the goal, this is the way. Got it. And, 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 you know, and I think sometimes people get kind of like, they, they just don't, they, 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 they lose track of the fact that like the path to get you where you want to be might not be the path that you want to take, right. but it's the only path that gets you there. That makes sense. I think right. uh, Microsoft has gone through that evolution over the last 10 years or so from let's build everything that only runs on windows to let's build things that will run, you know, using Linux. And yeah. Using and I, and again, I, I think it comes back down to being like, you know, the cloud, like at the end of the day, like we, you know, there, we want people to run stuff on our cloud and we recognize the fact that not that people are going to run stuff on our cloud, but also on other clouds. Right. And they don't necessarily want to just uh, work with people or hire people who've only built stuff for one cloud. Right. I think that's the other thing I, I point out to people, which is like hiring's tough. Right. And if you put up all these barriers by saying like, oh, well, like you can only, you know, if I'm going to be on Azure, the only people I can hire are people who have been, who've worked on Azure before. I probably just cut my hiring pool in half. Yeah. Right. But if you use open source tech and you use Kubernetes and you use containers, like I can hire you even if you've been on AWS for a really long time. Cause if you have experience with Kubernetes, it's basically the same and you can run stuff on AKS and it'll be basically the same. And like, you know, that, that unified ecosystem is, is a huge value prop along a lot of different, dimensions. Okay. Right. By the time you decided um, to open source this, the, there was something called the Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, was created uh, yeah. almost in parallel. That actually came right? a year later. It was, okay. No, actually, Cloud Native are, Computing Are they related to each other? Is the fact that you created computers? Yeah. And this... Craig is, yeah, Craig is the, Craig McClucky, who is one of the co-creators with me and Joe Beta, um, he's really the person who created the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. I am, um, you know, built the coalition found everybody got all the interested parties and it actually launched a year later um after we'd released kubernetes um with kubernetes as core, sort of it's like you know core initial project it had kubernetes and a couple other projects okay so that's the strong ties um, you were the the flagship product for we the were the, we, we all were and i would say still are the flagship yeah. product in the cncf now it now was created in under the you know governance of the linux foundation which had existed for a very very long time um, and I think that the motivation for the foundation was really around trust, really like, um, you need that vendor neutral place for intellectual property mm -hmm. and even something as prosaic as like, uh, logos, you know, you need a place where you can put that so that if I'm a company and I'm building a product on top of Kubernetes, I know for a fact that nobody else is going to come after me for trademark. Mm. Right. Or going to come after me. Like I can't be in a situation where I build a product and we, we've seen this right with various companies who've try or various projects who've resisted going into the CNCF. Um, I think Istio, the service mesh is probably the most, you know, 
egregious example of this where like people held it back for a long time to put it into the CNCF because they didn't want it. They kind of, that's what we were talking about earlier. They wanted to be like, no, no, it's ours. Mm. Right. And over time they eventually realized like, well, crap, like you just can't right. like, you know, you may want that, but like, it just doesn't work. Um, and so, you know, the, eventually like a year ago, they donated it to CNCF and, and it's just because, you know, people want the trust that comes from knowing that it's in a vendor neutral foundation, not in, you know, some, some other companies, you know, uh, a legal portfolio. Okay. Uh, so w we can argue, uh, we can disagree about whether or not two years from <laughs> the, the idea to taking over the world is a shorter or a long time, but, uh, I'm just saying it felt long. <laughs> I'm saying it felt long. But, know. uh, a lot of happens said there's a whole ecosystem built around Kubernetes since you created that's, uh, really outside of your yep. control entirely that the creators control. Oh yeah, for sure. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, so that was interesting too. Cause like I hadn't really done very much in the, um, in the startup world really mm -hmm. before I started doing the Kubernetes work. Like, I mean, you know, that it exists and maybe you've you know read some books or something like that, but I never really experienced the startup world, like really directly. Um, and what was interesting in the CNCF ecosystem is that cloud was really, I think, you know, exploding at the time. And, um, so venture capital was like pouring money into cloudish companies. And, and a lot of them were maybe not a lot of them. I think all of them were open source practically. Um, and so you see this explosion of people doing open source projects inside of the CNCF ecosystem because they want their startup for monitoring or for security or for whatever to, you know, be the solution, right. the endorsed solution for that particular area of the ecosystem. Um, and I think, you know, from early days on, both Kubernetes and CNCF really, at a philosophic level, tried hard not to be kingmakers, right? Really proactively said, like, no, no, we want a, a lot of different flowers to bloom. And we're not going to, like, say, oh, just because there's one monitoring solution in CNCF, we can't have a second monitoring solution in CNCF. Or just because there's one database, we can't have a second database, because that's the path towards, like, king choosing, right. you know, king making. Um and so the combination, I think, of that, of like all of this venture money and this sort of open, really open foundation and a lot of interest, of course, as the industry pivots, means there was just this like sort of Cambrian explosion of, of projects, right? Um, I like that Cambrian explosion. And I'm going to use that. Not my term, by the way. I've <laughs> stolen it from, I, I don't remember who I stole it from, but I stole it from. I know who else. I remember, who I stole um, it from. <laughs> uh, you know, um, it might have been Kevin Scott. CTO, Microsoft CTO. Um, so, you know, and, and, and then you end up with the, everybody making fun of like the eye chart logo, you know, like logo wall and all this kind of <laughs> stuff. And, you know, we had to actually, when we were doing, when I was doing CNCF governance, um, we spent a bunch of time on like, cause everybody wanted to be in the CNCF, but we didn't like, it's hard to judge every single project. Yeah. And so you have these choices of like, are you going to be a bottleneck? And are you going to have like a really rigorous judging process? Mm -hmm. In which case, you know, people are going to be really upset because they want their project in and they're going to put pressure. And they, we, we were starting to see this, like they're going to lever whatever pressure they can apply, whether it's their VCs, whether it's connections, whether it becomes it's political you know, friends, whatever. They'll just fan out and try and like press you hard to get you to accept their project. Um, and it was starting to burn out some of the governance people. Hmm. Um, or the other option is basically you just let everybody in. Um, but then at that point, like you might be applying your in endorsement in quotes to something that really probably shouldn't something like, you have embedded. Yeah. Not even secure. Sure. Right. Like, or maybe it's going to be a project that's going to die after six months or whatever. And so, you know, we had to establish this, what we ended up landing on was uh, we have the sandbox where if you're in the sandbox level of, of CNCF, you're in the CNCF from a governance perspective, like a vendor neutrality perspective, you've donated your logos and your intellectual property and all that. But we haven't really endorsed you. I see. Um, and you don't get any marketing and you don't get any, you don't get to get a KubeCon booth or you don't get any, you don't get any of the like stuff that you get if you're a, a more official project within the CNCF. Um, and then there's an incubating stage, which is, which is actually judged relatively carefully. Um, and then there's a graduated stage, which is the, like, lots of people are using you and there's a handful of graduated projects. Um, so that was interesting, right. To figure out like, how do you actually have this ecosystem where there's this like giant sandbox where honestly, like a lot of those projects aren't even going to live for six months. 
all the way up to these graduated projects, which are the things where we're saying like, no, no, you really should be using this. Like you, this is part of what it means to build a cloud native application. Mm. Um, that whole figuring out that whole governance process was, was kind of fascinating. Mm. Um, and uh, I mean, similarly, we had to write governance documents for Kubernetes. I mean, like, it's funny, you learn all these, I mean, you start spend. I mean, as I said, like you spent the first year just trying to create an open source project, just like, how do I do releases? How do I do testing? How do I, you know, PRs and all that stuff. And then you spend the next two years, like trying to convince everybody to use your thing. Right. Um, but at the same time, then you have to write down the rules. Like what are the rules of this community? Like once it becomes clear that it's going to be a thing and it's going to be a thing that needs to live for a long time, how do you step back? Who's going to replace you? What, what happens when they step back? Who replaces them? And, Okay, so we're going to have elections because we don't believe in dictatorships and like, but who gets to vote, right? Mm -hmm. And because like, what if the largest companies, what if everybody gets to vote and then the largest companies just get their share, right? So like, we had to come up with all of these rules um, that govern the community. Uh, code of conduct is another really, important, it turns out like at a certain scale, you know, unfortunately, people who are not very nice show up in your projects and they say not nice things right. and they act in not nice ways. And you need to make sure that you have a process in place to both judge them fairly, but also evict them if they need to be evicted. Um, and, you know, security committees, like what happens when somebody reports a vulnerability and how do you make sure you can cover it like in an embargoed way and hand it out to the various distributors so that they can handle it? You know, and like the thing is that there haven't been very many open source projects that are this successful. Right. And so there wasn't, especially then. So you had to and, invent and I hope these that we sort of left as you went along. There was some yeah, like we would be like, no, hey, no JS. Like, what the heck? Hey, what do you do? Like, what the heck do you do? And they'd be like, well, we kind of figured out. Like, and it would be like, hey, Linux kernel folks, like, what do you do? And and nothing quite fit. Mm. Like, and so we would sort of mix and match, and we'd be like, because like you know, for the kernel, a lot of it relies on the distributors. Like, almost no one uses the kernel by itself, mm -hmm. they use the Red Hat kernel, or they use the Ubuntu kernel, or they use the Azure Linux kernel, right? So like, a lot of the process has been kicked over to Red Hat, or it's kicked over to Ubuntu, or it's kicked over to Microsoft for the Azure. Whereas like Kubernetes was trying to do it all, like we are the open source repository, but we're also the release managers, and we're also the testers. Mm -hmm. And we're also like, you know, doing at least a little bit of the distribution and the documentation. So like, we were kind of unique. You're talking to Node.js and Node.js is like, well, like we're just kind of the runtime and people opt in, they choose it and they run, you know? So like, it was interesting to kind of try and piece together, um, you know, and we were sort of built ground up from GitHub, which is a whole different kind of way of doing open source. Like the kernel had started on mailing lists. Well, you know, well, there was email, no GitHub like, Emailing time, patches. There was no Git. There was no Git. Right. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, it was interesting. It was a lot of learning, a lot of learning um, you got and, and along a lot of different dimensions. You got through it. You've got so, a good platform. Yeah, place. you got through it. It's interesting. And, and now I'm like not super involved. You know, I mean, like I'm, I'm, I'm pretty involved. My team is really involved. Okay. And I got a bunch of really great people who are pretty deeply involved in the Kubernetes community. Um, but, you know, I, I've moved on to other things, too. And that's been fun as well. I want to talk a little about that because you've been at Microsoft for a few years now. What is Microsoft and, and your team doing around Kubernetes? Yeah, so I mean, well, my, my team runs the Azure Kubernetes service, um, which is the, I, you know, I'm obviously I'm biased, but it's the best way to run Kubernetes in the cloud. Um, and, you know, we also do uh, work really closely with the Edge team and help them package up um, the AKS uh, at the Edge for IoT use cases and HCI. Um, and then my team also is responsible for uh, a bunch of upstream contributions. So I have a team that's a dedicated open source upstream uh, team, which really just focuses on working in Kubernetes and other CNCF um, projects and just contributing back, whether it's, you know, being chairs of special interest groups or contributing code or being a release manager or whatever else, like they just go and um, try and move that community forward. And, you know, we honestly, we have people who do that for the Linux kernel as well. And for, you know, system D and for other pieces of the open source ecosystem. Cause if you want to do a good job running open source, you have to have people who are involved in the projects yeah. um, to, to contribute back. All right. We're almost at time. I just, if somebody wants to learn more about Kubernetes, what would you recommend is a good place to start? 
Uh, yeah, so I mean, like the Kubernetes.io website is pretty good. It's got a fair amount of documentation. Um, there's also, you know, just a little bit selfishly, of course, um, I wrote a book with Joe Beta and Lockie Evanson and Kelsey Hightower called Kubernetes Up and Running. Um, there's actually a free copy available from Azure. Uh, you can find that PDF and download I'll put a link PDF, in the show notes. Awesome. Uh, in exchange for, I think, your email address. All right. If not I get too, a, if, not too bad. Not a, too bad. If I get the digital copy, um, will you autograph it for me? I will sign your Kindle. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, those are pretty good resources. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of like meetups and that sort of thing as well. Like the community is still pretty strong yeah. in each local area. So I definitely encourage connecting with other people as well in those forums. Awesome. Yeah. Brenda, thank you so much. This has been really educational. I've, I've been learning about Kubernetes the last 12 months. I've really been uh, uh, exponentially expanding my knowledge on cool. it. And uh, today I've learned a few things as well. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Throughout everything I've done in my career in technology, I've been really focused on helping people feel that technology is more their friend. <laughs>